Welcome again to another um, of our events of CPD in 43. Today is uh, Wednesday the 15th of November. Uh, it's our penultimate event for the year. Uh, it's inclusive design, common and less well-known issues. Um, it's from a, a former colleague of mine, actually, um, a highly experienced architect uh, with over 30 years of experience, uh, specialist experience in regards to access consultancy, um, and also is a published author as well uh, on the same subject as well. Um, so uh, without further ado, I'll hand it straight over to Steve. Steve will take over and as usual, uh, he'll do the presentation and then we'll have our Q&A session towards the end. So please do, if you have any questions or queries, please do field them into the chat box. Um, I will be in there fielding those and then as usual, I will then come back in and ask the questions to our speaker um, and then bring the event to a close roughly around quarter two or on 43 minutes if we can manage that. Um, but uh, without further ado, thank you, Steve, and I'll hand it straight over. Okay, here we go. Just. Uh... Select the screen. Can everyone see that? Yeah, that's fine. OK, so uh, no more ados. Let's get started. So inclusive design, common and less well-known issues. Um, so as a way of introduction, I, as already mentioned, I'm an architect. I'm a member of the National Register of Access Consultants, and I sit in a I have a variety of other capacities that are listed there on the slide. I won't read them all. I'm also technical authority for inclusive design at uh, Atkins Realis. Um, please note I am not speaking on behalf of RIBA, BSI, NRAC, etc. Um, this is a, just a, a, a talk. Uh, there is a disclaimer with this, this um, uh, uh, just to bear that in mind. Um, this is presented with goodwill. Um, you'll need to appoint me to hold me accountable for any advice I give. Basically, the message there. Um, uh, then um, uh, this is the team I sit in. So uh, um, I work with uh, a gentleman called Cornell. Um, he's um, uh, comes from an urban design background and architecture tr training, Kirsten Galilea, who's a, a architect like me, and um, and particularly Kelder, who's our uh, children and play specialist. Um, she brings a lot of insights of uh, impacts of designs on children and, and play uh, and, and family. Um, we're involved in a variety of research activities. Um, these are just some of the um, indication of some of those that we're involved in. We have several people across the business that we link in with who deal with various particular specialist aspects that add to our capabilities around inclusive design um, uh, rather than being just um, pigeonholed um, and siloed. Um, we have a, a lot of cross linking between disciplines and a lot of senior backing from senior um, uh, directors. Um, so just we like to begin our presentations in Atkins Realis from a, a, a um, with a safety moment. Uh, my safety moment is relates to in, inclusive design. Um, when we're looking at health and safety, the question is what are you, are our assumptions based on? And um, I, my suggestion is, um, or question following that is, do you take account of sight, lack of sight and perception of hazards? Um, so um, just worth bearing in mind that when you start to consider people may not be able to see or perceive what you've designed and may become um, a, a, um, a susceptible to uh, um, the hazard it then increases the risk and we then need to um, see, seek ways to addressing that in the design. So um, so the next section is around why inclusive design. So I'll give start with an introduction to what inclusive design is. is essentially, it's about everybody. Uh, it does definitely include disabled people, but it's just not just about disabled people. It's about designing a performance envelope 
inclusive of all people with diverse requirements. And this includes uh, different abilities, age, gender, belief, identity, pregnancy, childhood language and neurodiversity, etc. And so in the built environment, uh, age, gender, belief and identity can have some impact on what we design, but it is it is in particular around uh, abilities and the experience of disabled people. There are two main models of disability, uh, the medical and the, the social model. The medical model is somewhat frowned upon. Um, it um, takes the assumption that, it, that someone's impairment is what disables them, whereas the social model um, takes the view it's the environment and society that uh, disables. Uh, um, and therefore, attitudes about how to fix the issues um, change somewhat from um, f trying to fix the person and uh, to trying to fix the environment. I do, however, uh, like a model of enabling, which is much more collaborative and uh, empowering and enab uh, enabling where um, we've all got something to offer one, one another and we also have things we could ask of one another and just because somebody may have a, um, a particular disability or impairment um, uh, it doesn't mean that they there isn't not something they uh, they could be uh, offering to assist oneself in in one's own area of need much more empowering. Anyway, so uh, going back to the original question, well, why inclusive design? Well, uh, um, other than it's just important and it's beneficial um, and it has a significant impact on the value of what uh, outcome and design um, in terms of the user experience of that design. Um, there is the Equality Act and the public sector equality duty that comes out of that, that and the need to, for clients, particularly public sector um, clients, to consider the equality, uh, diversity or stroke equality impact of the, um, a design. And they need a really traceable inclusive design evaluation process. So um, how did, it, how did uh, the end design come to uh, the point it was, if should they um, be challenged at a later date. Um, and really important to understand um, there's no such thing as a DDA compliant design or an Equality Act compliant design. And I use a, math, a, a picture of a mouthwash here. I hear this term so bandied around so much and it, I would really encourage you not to use it because it misinforms the client our clients. Um, uh, it's not a D, uh, DDA, uh, except for Northern Ireland, is no longer in force in, in Great Britain. Um, and neither the, equality, uh, the DDA or the Equality Act are um, design standards that you can comply with. And it has more to do with clients' du duties and responsibilities. And this, this involves considering operational and communication responsibilities that they have and um, he, an, in, in an inclusive experience is not just dependent on the environment, it's also dependent on how that environment is operated and managed and how people communicate about what opportunity there is. Um, I like to express the importance of uh, achieving an equality of design um, and achieving an inclusive user experience. And I am. Um, user ex, UX design and service design. If you want to look those up, those terms, I, I go by them a lot. And I, I a lot of what I um, practice, I believe, is part of uh, service design and user experience design thinking. How to design inclusively? Well, um, aim for a positive user experience informed by diversity is the starting point. As I said, it's intrinsically related to value um, for the uh, client in, the, in terms of the end result, because um, designs are experienced by people. And if there's going to be any um, problem in that experience, it's very likely to relate to how inclusive the environment is or not. Um, 
so um, myself and uh, a fellow um, um, member of the uh, Schumacher Institute for Sustainable Systems, um, who themselves got experience of um, um, uh, accessibility um, uh, con considerations, um, uh, developed this uh, envelope, uh, envelope of need concept of mobility, visual, auditory, neurological, and metabolic needs that everybody has that uh, creates a performance envelope when we're designing environments. And Michael Clinton, who co-developed this with me, is an aeronautically and tra uh, mechanically trained engineer. And we use that, um, the performance envelope concept from aeronautical engineering to come up with this principle. Um, Together with this goes uh, design themes of personal logistics, legibility of the environment, how you, how you navigate it, clarity, that's it's mainly acoustics and visual clarity, the psychological impact of the design and the ergonomics, i.e. The, the physical interactions of the design and then effectively you pretty well get arrive at covering everything. Um, we, at, by putting these together, you get uh, the um, universal design. And if um, uh, another term that you may want to look up um, uh, and the, in terms of philosophy, how, how one approaches it. If we don't get it right, it's um, uh, like a, a glove that doesn't fit or severing our fingers on a hand. It's injurious, it's impairing and it's inequitable. Um, and people get left get left out um, of the resulting envelope, and it's individual uh, impairing and injurious for uh, individuals and society because if it affects individuals, it'll be affecting society in in the wider terms. We like to consider um, these uh, the, these five points of need from the envelope of need in developing. Uh, a user UX or user experience uh, assessment through um, developing persona narratives, I s s stories or scenarios that we can follow through and work out, you know, how a design is going to impact people with particular needs and requirements. Um, I hope by now most folk have heard of BF 300 parts one and two. Um, uh, there are other guidance we draw upon. As, as such as PAS 6463 um, that had uh, hand in um, uh, seeing come to fruition. Um, so common design issues. So let's um, uh, cover a few of these. Uh, I will then get, get look at some less well known issues. So um, common design issues often relate to a lack of understanding. Um, so this is uh, not necessarily uh, architectural context, but I thought this was quite an apt um, protest sign that someone had painted on the outside of the house about how a, a resident parking zone um, scheme didn't properly factor in uh, um, blue badge holders um, who could only park in their bays uh, designated for them, and if someone else had parked in them, they couldn't park anywhere else on conventional base. Um, that got challenged and altered. If we get into the sort of more architectural considerations of, um, or technical considerations of um, uh, parking, um, I think one of the keys oh, for, with Blue Badge Bays is to consider the need for people have for transitioning out of the side of the vehicles, both sides, and um, quite often the back, and it depends uh, which way people are facing. Um, so you've got the bay uh, shown on the left hand side. Um, it's not really ideal with the uh, rear access ramps for them to be um, landing outside of that bay into the driveway, into the roadway. Uh, better to provide access to, so if I point to it, access onto the um, the paved area at the back, so for a ramp to be 
deployed and whilst uh, guidance suggests that signage should be at the back of the bay I, I suggest it's if it's off to the center it allows one to deploy a, a ramp if you've got a paved area at the back this ne next bay layout is indicating in a very indicative sense EV charging needs. Um, we need to not forget that if, if you require EV charging, you need to consider um, where you, uh, the space needed to maneuver and um, plug those in. Uh, uh, guidance also suggests providing extra large base. Um, worth looking at BSH 300 about that. And on roadside bays, um, importance of getting the width wide enough something like 3.6 allows people to transition on that on the roadside without necessarily being in the carriageway i also like to try and come with transition looking the transition directly in the bay rather than uh, over here as in bs 300 i'm not too keen on this particularly with tactiles that are supposed to only be used um for when you're crossing points so if you put plastic blister tactiles in here someone could potentially expect a crossing point um, and therefore corresponding landing error on the other side of the roadway, except in this situation, it potentially gets sent out in the roadway. So I'm not too keen on that. Um, uh, this is a, a um, given analogy between um, arriving. So uh, a, so some people arriving at a building is like um, trying to um, dock with a, um, a space station and it's much better if they can get really close and kind of get in um, easily by um, uh, their arrival point being uh, close to the building uh, and ideally undercover um, so they're not uh, um, susceptible to um, inclement weather um, and um, but uh, if you get uh, it wrong it's a bit like um people having to yeah expecting people to space walk um that's the an analogy another common issue i come across is the lack of clarity so this is outside the welsh assembly building um these these this line here and that line there and there are changes in level they're terraced changes in level um, there's no visual indication on there. They can potentially get, if even people were looking at them and perceived them, they might think they are steps, not understand that, that the drop is much greater. And then you've got steps going on down here, and I can't say that particularly clear either. Okay. Um, uh, uh, sorry, this, this image is a bit blurry, but um, forgive me, got it out of my archives. I think it was a blurry one. Um, but nevertheless, um, you can uh, see that a common issue is, and I see this all the time, glazed a door in a glazed screen and no tonal contrast treatment for the actual entrance. So which one of those is the door? Well, you get some indication possibly white by the little, little white label. The, the manifestation isn't particularly clear either. And really, we should be making sure the portal is clear um, and, and that people know where it is. Another common issue is to do with if you imagine this this wall to the side wasn't here and you've got a PIR um, detection for the automatic opening of the door. If you've got people movement very close to that, you get false triggering and that cause all sorts of problems from a, um, a facilities management point of view. Um, so making sure that a peer, um, the walking route in front of uh, these of door doors is uh, set away from the PR, um, PIR uh, detection is really important. And oh, sorry, and then looking at um, how you, um, if you've got a, a, a door entry system, uh, how does that work from a, um, uh, a the perspective of um, uh, people who are uh, deaf and hard of hearing? is a CTTV to see what's going on, to figure out if someone's struggling to get in. Um, is there an indication that when you're speaking that, um, uh, that they um, through uh, someone's speaking through the intercom from the other side, 
that they're acknowledging your call. Um, and if you haven't got any visual indication that that can be a real problem um, for people um, knowing what on earth is happening if they're not able to hear the intercom. Um, it's quite uncommon for lobbies and the, door, the distance between swings to be um, uh, too tight um, and, and less, than, less than what's recommended in BSA 300. Um, now, I know this isn't a barrier matter, but you can get the idea that I'm trying to convey. Um, is Have you got sufficient length of barrier matting to re remove moisture from underfoot? No matter times I see barrier matting, that's inadequate in length. And consequently, when people, uh, when the building's opened, facilities management bring out temporary ramp uh, mats, um, a mat to, so people can dry their feet off uh, properly. And the amount of times I see that happen when it could have been dealt with by adequate forethought about the depth of the um, barrier matting. Um, be, be careful though of this patterning and I will explain that later. There's a real issue with that. Um, hopefully most people are familiar with LRV values and the importance of tonal contrast. It's worth pointing out there's only really about um, four tonal options. Um, get if you want about four differences in tone if you're trying to combine things. I try and encourage people to keep um, uh, so we got sort of too little contrast. This is too much contrast. This is arguably too much contrast. If you reduce the contrast, then you reduce some of the um, uh, visual processing issues that you can get with high contrasting patterns, which I'll be again explaining later. Uh, um, consider your lift carefully. Um, I still to this day see people suggest um, proposing platform lifts in new buildings far too readily. There are circumstances where um, they are appropriate, um, but um, passenger lifts are much more preferred from their functionality from access and for delivering uh, egress. So I'm a big proponent of evacuation lifts um, because not everyone can transfer to evacuation devices used on stairs. Um, please consider the, the space, the landing space clear of circulation. So another issue that comes up um, and if you if you, through lifts are um, very helpful in certain situations, particularly where you've got high volumes of movement. And just so this is this this indicating a sort of a, a, a convex mirror that you can put in to allow people to enable people to reverse um, and see what they're doing when they reverse uh, as, a, as an alternative to the wall mirror. Think about choice of toilets carefully. Um, there's a variety here, and the the, the figure references are there. Um, bear in mind that um, a, a wheelchair access WC is, such as figure 40 here, um, is not an ambulant access WC. But hence, if you if, you, if the toilet's the only play, only if you only got one toilet in the whole building or in the in the particular location of a building, then it really ought to be going for the two meter wide. Um, uh, layout with an extra height basin. Uh, if you've ever, as I have, had to walk around with crutches, you'll find it's quite difficult to get to the low hand-rinse basin. Um, and then you've got sort of ambulant layouts, sort of in cubicle and um, standalone layouts here. Um, and then there's a, a adult changing places here, and this is a layout where you've got um, baby changing. Okay, so um, toilet configuration, the amount of times I see toilets set out incorrectly, it's very, 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 very clear. Um, there are probably some interpretation things to be aware of, but um, uh, the, um, oops, sorry, um, sorry, that, that's moved, that little, um, that pull cord should be here. <laughs> uh, it's moved on the slide, but um, other, you can see it where it sh everything should be. Um, uh, uh, please try and keep as close to that as possible. 
And I know there can, can be practicality issues, but there are reasons why that layer is out there. And the amount of time people morph it without knowing what they're doing um, uh, uh, happens in too many times, really. Anyway, um, the other, one thing to watch out around uh, flush, the flush should be on the green so arrow side, not on the red arrow side. If you, someone's transferring from this side of the toilet, um, they need to be able to reach across uh, and pull the uh, flush. Similar basin position, uh, it, you need to be in reach and preferably the tap, the tap needs to be as close as possible. Therefore, um, uh, if it, um, it shouldn't be f f the furthest away from the toilet. Uh, can you, can people operate things with one hand? Um, you know, toilet dispensers, etc. Hand try choices. This the di this uh, version of the Dyson hand dryer is not particularly accessible. This is preferable. And there are other makes out there, so I'm not recommending Dyson in particular. Uh, lighting control, um, you know, switches can be quite awkward to operate. Um, if you're using PIR, think about the length of time. Um, you don't want the light going off when people are in there. Think of the transfer space and the space to get in and clear of door. Think about guarding of doors into corridors, particularly on external corners to stop doors clashing. Doors should be a capable of opening outwards. Um, clause 5.4E of volume two of the part M is very clear about that, but the amount of times I see that not happening. Um, Mungry should be capable of being operated with a closed fist. Um, all doors in, um, should have 300 leading edge to the side. At times I see that not happening, um, so that's another thing to pick up. Now I'm I'm conscious of time. Um, is it, uh, I'll just um, if you're reviewing that this later, you'll see some of the list of recommendations. The stairs image behind is not ideal. It's very visually noising. It, it noisy. It's got open treads, but there's a number of um, points to bear in mind when considering stairs. A similar list uh, that should say, sorry, that should have said a reception. Didn't change the slide title on that. And anyway, um, it's a list of considerations there. So less well-known issues and conscious of time. Um, so I'd encourage people to look up sensory integration theory. There's a brief explanation about it's how we process sensory information. It's worth bearing in mind that we all have a, a cognitive load capacity and um, this affects the window of um, sensory information we can process. Um, it's worth bearing in mind if we have no sound, so no sound, i.e. in an anechoic chamber with no light, our brains really struggle to function. Just goes to show how important sensory information is. In, is. If we go from there, uh, we've got different brains, um, and then we process sight, hearing, smell, taste, tactile information, temperature information, balance, body position and awareness and time differently. So we have diverse calibrations and um, there are dominant uh, semi-elective and elective senses and places come with the, uh, predominant signal, semi fitable signals and signals that we can um, uh, filter much more easily. And this results into sort of um, passive stimuli, semi-passive stimuli and um, sorry, pervasive stimuli and semi-pervasive stimuli, which are the ones that can cause problems and um, we need to bear in mind. So visual input is really important. Now, some a lot of the images are going to them how, themselves have visual noise. And I give this warning because uh, people may not like some of the uh, following image, but I want to try and convey the issues. Now, visual information can have impact, impact on people's balance. I've had architecture students be, have issues with patterns like this. Um, so a barrier matting sort of moisture removal, but the patterns causing issues for people going over it. Um, 
this I um, this type of pattern affected some particularly affected some students I was teaching and uh, um, it uh, messed with their balance um, and one person said that they couldn't walk down this uh, these stairs without um, losing their balance uh, or not without whilst talking so they indicated if they were talking at the same time they probably affect the balance you get visual noise in this sort of effect you also get a confusion with steps for some people there's visual all sorts of things going with this um, uh, floor pattern uh, reflections and pattern and confusion you get illusions you get a dazzle effect which um, can cause it to they get extra dazzle effects and then some people take upon themselves to put it on colorful crossings which is not ideal so so what the impact of this is freeze flight migraines and epilepsy and i have known sometimes um, people um, one person uh, described how their sight cuts off when they're subjected to a certain vi uh, visual noise this must be quite alarming you can get sensory overload with vertigo though, from actual vertigo scenarios like near being a drop, but actually you can get a sense of vertigo from the depth varying perception that things like a zebra crossing can give you. You can get different responses to auditory environments. Um, this is particularly relates to some of my experience. I was late learning to speak and I've had auditory processing difficulties. So uh, background noise um, can cause an issue. I particularly, for my own experience, um, crisp packets are really problematic. Uh, you can have um, problems with smell. So particularly newly installed carpets um, can sometimes and other products can cause issues for people. Um, if uh, one of the importance is about buildings is thermal comfort because people's ability to manage their comfort levels vary. Lighting is really important. Tactile environments. Similarly, um, let whilst it has um, it's more selective. Um, don't forget it's got, it can be underfoot in certain situations, felt through feet. So. Uh, so what? So well, um, these issues can uh, uh, impact people's attention, stress levels, balance, well-being, orientation, and can lead to quite serious phenomenon. Solutions include achieving sensory balance, starting with a arm um, canvas, um, and then like preparing ingredients for uh, um, a plate. Think about what you put in there. So, from a place making point of view, you could use some positive um, choice of sim stimuli. Natural patterns tend to, the frequencies count, tend to cancel themselves and cause less issue. I wouldn't suggest that you put things like running water all over the place and then the sound of that. But if it's in some places and not pervasive, then it can help people orientate and give some positive stimuli if they want to access the stimuli. It's choice is really important. Similarly with olfactory eye smells, um, uh, you want to create, you don't want to put smells where people can't avoid them, but you might put them where people have a choice to go and um, uh, uh, enjoy. Um, the smells if they it affects them. What you want to avoid is pervasive sensory noise signals, and um, by placing them um, in putting them in places where people can't avoid them. There is more to this subject, as I mentioned. My colleague Calder um, has insights on the impact on children and um, uh, and families, and that includes young adults. So it's worth considering. Um, the impact of design on uh, 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 the younger members of the population. Um, we also like to think about personal security um, and how, whether people feel safe or not in environment um, and uh, is a variety of other things as I said we've researched into and we could uh, um, perhaps um, unravel at a later date if people are interested. Anyway, um, thank you for th listening, and I'm afraid I've gone a little bit over time, but um, quite a bit to go through, um, and 
bit far away <laughs> with questions. No, that's fine. Uh, thank you so much for that, Steve. Um, just to remind everyone to ask any questions into the chat box so we can field them to Steve. Um, I'll kick it off with um, uh, one thing that's always been itching in the back of my mind is that we've got um, obviously a number of senses, uh, which you've alluded to. Um, yeah. and I feel like there's um, uh, always another sense to be added to to the list. Um, so we've got um, from my last recollection, was it is it is it up to ten now, or is it is it more? There's a right um, there's about that. So you got um, the five traditional senses uh, that most people are aware of, and on top of that, um, it worth thinking about. Um, so what's called the vestibular sense, which is balance. And the proprioceptive sense, which is body um, awareness, position awareness, and they're heavily influenced by visual input. And uh, um, some quite hazardous environments are created by poor visuals. Um, um, and uh, and that can affect people's balance um, and, and a body position, and they potentially can fall over. And, and that it can be then implicated, particularly in the experiences of people living with um, Parkinson's. Mm -hmm. um, but you, you do, uh, I've known of people without Parkinson's who get affected by um, problematic patterns. Then uh, um, you've got, it's worth bearing in mind, time. So one of the biggest signals for time is light and exposure to light. Mm -hmm. Um, if you've ever been watching, um, using your um, uh, digital devices and looking at white light for late into the evening, it affects your light, your sleeping. Um, it, you can find it harder to have a, a better, a good night's sleep. If any of you are suffering from insomnia, that might well be a factor if you're watching too, um, too much um, on your phone late at night. Um, and then um, uh, you're going to have uh, uh, introception, which is what body awareness of what goes on inside. Temperature uh, is an, uh, another thing I like putting apart. And I, I'm not sure. Oh, we've got up to ten, but we're there's a, there about. <laughs> yeah, I think. Yeah, I think there's there's pain pain as well as one, isn't it? Or, or, or is that Ooh, it falls under? Other um, one? Uh, pain is uh, like associated with that extreme tactile, isn't it? Mm -hmm. um, I think, um, but um, I would I put a pivot in the um, tactile level, sort of touch. There's also related to touch is something called deep pressure, mm -hmm. which is slightly different. So um, people, particularly when they um, have a hug from somebody else, um, get the benefit of deep pressure. That can can be quite reassuring to some people, um, mm -hmm. um, and uh, uh, how people feel in furniture. That's probably where sometimes that enfolding and, and design of furniture may have a benefit in that that sense. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No. Definitely. And I know um, you did make um, uh, some effort to sort of go through um, uh, toilet design. Um, yes. Sort of general sort of specific <laughs> spatial design. Death, I <laughs> no, no, I remember us, us talking about this about probably 15 years ago. So, um, yeah. Um, but um, it is is the, the I I completely understand and probably sort of like to take that point slightly further. There's there's nuances on, on sort of making sure that you're designing um, spaces accordingly. Um, probably maybe slightly sort of further in regards to sort of toilet design then you potentially sort of then steer off into um, safeguarding so for example not using glass using plastic and things like that so uh, yeah. specific handles and uh, so the anti-ligature sort of pull cords and things like that um, so yeah. there's all I mean it just really depends um, where where these spaces are going to be yeah. in, introduced and how they're going to be integrated and so on and uh, yeah, we we visited. I I do believe remembering visiting on sort of anti ligature and accessible at the same time in custody suites and things like that. So it's um um it's uh, at that point you you need to work through it very carefully. But 
Um, uh, my big thing, what I would really encourage people is um, pay very careful attention to the toilet layouts and don't mess about with them. Don't put soil pipes in the middle, in the corner of the layout on a conventional wheelchair access loo because you won't be able to set the, the, everything out right. Make sure you've got it behind an IPS or duct uh, system at the back of the toilet and you've allowed enough space so that your dimensions are also between finishes, not stru um, structural um, wall positions, so all sorts of things you want to build in when you're designing new things and the amount of times people get it wrong. And the same with doors, people getting putting too narrow doors in or using um, BIM to put a, um, a, 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 a family or block into drawings uh, of a door that doesn't work um, and they fix their layout from an early layout point and they can't fix things, fix things later. So um, <laughs> get these crucial things working out door circulation and toilets and it'll make things much easier to s later on. And a um, really important thing I, I would want to stress um, is um, it's not just about accessibility, it's about egressibility and um, really take seriously how are people going to get out and bear in mind not everyone can transfer to evac devices that are used on stairs. So what should you there before be doing and what should the client be aware of? Mm -hmm. And in terms of managing liabilities and interacting with clients, that's really important you have conversations about the operational stages of um, them delivering their duties and uh, in terms of fire evacuation. Um, and it's really important that you um, n in no way um, leave the impression that you've handled everything to do with um, accessibility and um, a, uh, inclusive design and equalities. Um, you need to keep the client involved in, 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 in enable them to come to informed decisions or at the very least tell them if they're not, not engaging with the, their the management questions you've conveyed to them that you've um, what your assumptions are and what you think the management implications might be or yeah. something akin to that so that you're not ended up if someone flags up a problem later um, having a client that comes to you and says oh you're going to solve my design for me you were going to give me a DDA compliant design which is it's nonsense there's no such thing yeah. um, OK, it's that it, 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 it's a bit like fire, you know, a lot of the safety and safety, a lot of the duties of the clients, you need to help them get to a point where they can manage their duties. Hmm. Uh, we've got, um, I'll, I'll just ask one final question uh, from David. How would you suggest conflicts between British standards, uh, build, building regs uh, and best practice are managed? managed uh, is it simply a case of appointing an inclusive design specialist early on or are there things that you could sort of take into consideration well i would always think that advocating taking on an inclusive design specialist early on um uh and um i thought that one of the challenges for architectural practice um from an architectural practice and architectural technology practice point of view is that clients are assuming that you're going to deal with everything um and you really need to convey, no, no, actually, this person's here to help not only yourselves, but yourselves and have a help facilitate that conversation about how something's going to be operated. Um, so that's really important to get that message across. Um, I would we'll always start with BSA 300. Pardem is a minimum standard and doesn't differ hugely. Um, and arguably, if you can incorporate best practice, then do so. And a lot of best practice things, are, if you get them in early enough, are really not going to majorly impact um, cost. The one thing that could potentially have a, a cost impact is evacuation lifts and where you need to put, how many and where do you need to put to them. But we've got clients increasingly saying, as a matter of policy, they want them put in because they're increasingly recognizing the issues of not having them in terms of um, uh, um, certain types of environments you they got you know uh, they can't they can't properly consider they can't properly close out making sure that everyone can get safely out of the building during the evacuation phase um, 
So, um, and, that, and that therefore, rather than the cost realm, falls into the um, uh, the managing liabilities and responsibilities side of things. Um, yeah, do, but, um, clients tend to think, oh, I just wanted to do it to part M, and um, that's all very well. Um, but they need to understand the implications of doing minimum and that they're still left with the latent responsibilities that legally they should be considering um, from their own terms of their own responsibilities. If you don't okay. mind, there's a couple of other questions that just quickly came in. Yeah, so I'll, go rat yeah. <clears throat> I'll rattle through two and there won't be any more anyone. Yeah. Um, so if you do have any further questions, please do contact Steve directly. Um, so uh, one from Tahira, the current building regs are based on an old data set from 97. Arup have produced a report updating the data set as the requirements for space has changed over the years. The part published is on toilets. Have you seen the report which will feed into updating ADM and how important do you think these changes will be on the new regs and do they go far enough? Right, so there's a variety of studies that go on. Um, um, I, uh, we've done some spatial studies um, around wheelchairs for one particular client. We know there's an another one that's been carried out. Uh, I'm not surprised it would impact proposal about toilets. Um, and we'll see how that work pans out. Um, BSH 300 does provide for wider than part M. So 1.7 rather than 1.5, and it's worth bearing that in mind. There is a cutoff point, though, when overwatch practical. Um, uh, you get sort of door width issues and things like that. Um, um, I'm a big advocate of doors with side leaves for a lot. Where if you can put a door with a side leaf in, put it in. It will not only make increase the capability of people with wider than average wheelchairs um, in terms of actually getting through they may need assistance but nevertheless they at least can go through the yeah. opening um, if opened up um, but it also helps facilities managers if, about moving furniture around if you've got a side leaf and it also preserves the three normal likely to preserve the leading edge dimension space um, so a big piece of advice when you're dropping doors in <laughs> think why it can't be a door and a side leaf before you consider any other door. <laughs> okay, great. And then the final uh, but question. But I won't put a side leaf in an access toilet. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, final question from Daniel there. is, would you would you recommend happy principles, H-A-P-P-I principles, as a good starting point when designing houses? I wouldn't uh, discourage any well-being related p principles. Um, so I would include those in inclusive design thinking because how people wellness and how comfortable people feel is really important um, it also relates to the sustainability of our environment the only thing I would say um, is that some standards are not just saying particularly happy but other some have had a history of not paying that much attention to increased design aspects um quite the depth that they could do so just getting an accreditation in some of these areas doesn't always address things some of these accreditations do require you going off and getting something assessed from an access point of view and that's brilliant but some don't and not to the depth that they need to be so just be aware Great. Um, so uh, all that's left to do is obviously thank yourself, Steve, for doing the talk today. It was very much appreciated. Everyone in attendance, please do bear in mind um, that these are held on a monthly basis and in most cases, not in all cases, is uploaded to YouTube in due course. Um, just go to YouTube, type in CPD in 43 and it should all pop up. Um, so Today was inclusive design, common and less well-known issues. Our final talk for the year is on Wednesday, the 6th of December, uh, which is from Weinerberger, technical considerations when designing with brick. Um, so that will be our final talk for the year. And then obviously we've already, as mentioned in previous events where people have been um, present, I've mentioned that we do have the first quarter of 24 already arranged. Um, those will be advertised in due course. Um, 
Um, if you do have any specific topics you'd like us to cover, please do let us know. We're more than happy to and receptive to uh, consider any ideas you have. Um, ultimately, this is all for the betterment of everyone. And uh, I really hope that you enjoy our series of events. Uh, so look forward to seeing you at the uh, final event for the year obviously thank you to steve for a penultimate event and then obviously then moving into 2024 hopefully everyone has a break plan so uh look forward to seeing you in a, a month's time and uh, all the best